Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me for Reimagining Education, Conversations on Character, Commitment, and Community. This series is part of the Virtues and Vocations Initiative at Duke University, seeking to make character, purpose, and meaning central to education and pre-professional and professional education in particular. My name is Suzanne Shanahan, and I direct the Keenan Institute for Ethics here at Duke the institutional home for this initiative and this series. Before I turn to introducing today's guest, uh, I did wanna make two logistical notes. First, as with all things Zoom, there are often challenges that emerge unexpectedly. Please know that there are a series of folks behind the scenes who will swiftly jump in to address any problems that might emerge. Second, We'll have a conversation uh, with today's partner for about 40 minutes, and then we'll turn to audience Q&A. Please submit your questions through the Q&A mechanism. They will then be organized and aggregated and sent on to me to ask directly of the speaker. Uh, we tend to get lots and lots of questions, and so we try to organize them in ways that we can hopefully get to as many as possible but please, please do not take it personally if we don't happen to get to your particular question today. Um, and so with that, I would love to introduce uh, today's speaker, Francis Sue, who will be talking with us on character and mathematics. Francis Sue is the Benedictusson Karwa Professor of Mathematics at Harvey Mudd. He is also former president of the Mathematical Association of America. His research, in, and I'm going to mispronounce this, in geometric combinatorics and applications to the social sciences. Uh, he has co-authored numerous papers uh, with undergraduates. He also has a passion for teaching and popularizing mathematics um, through writing and public engagement. His work has been featured in Quanta Magazine, Wired, and the New York Times. From the Mathematical Association of America, he received the 2018 Halmas Ford Award for Mathematical Writing and the 2013 Haimo Award for Distinguished Teaching of College Level Mathematics. Three of his articles have been featured in Princeton Press's Best Writing on Mathematics in 2011, 2014, and 2018. He authors the popular Math Fun Facts website and is creator of Math Feed, the math news app. His book, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, was published by Yale University in 2020. It is an inclusive vision of what math is, who it is for, and why anybody should learn it. So uh, as I reflect on the fact that the Keenan Institute for Ethics uh, is inviting a math professor to a conversation. I think to myself, what? Uh, in the four years that I've been director, I don't think I ever would have imagined that one of the most eloquent uh, advocates for virtue would be a professor of math. Um, but I, I think as one of our staff members said, I love him without even having met him simply by reading his book, I think his grace, humility, and commitment will become quite clear. I also just wanted to share a snippet from his website uh, because I think it speaks to how well his vision of mathematics connects to our conversations about character here at the Institute. Um, on his website, he includes a personal note which goes, it feels funny to have a website touting things I've done. On the one hand, I love to share my work with others. On the other hand, I want to press back on the achievement-oriented culture we live in. I don't believe my accomplishments give me dignity, though I understand society uses them to establish credibility. My family and best friends could care less about my resume and they love me with all my faults. This grace centers me, and it is a reflection of a divine love that grounds human dignity in a source distinct from anything we do. 
this love also calls me um, calls to me to defend the dignity of others, which I strive to do through my teaching and writing. And with that, welcome, Francis. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Actually, so that I'd written then, put that on my website. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's such a delight to have you here with us today. Um, I'm hoping in the conversation we can do three different things. First, I'd love to consider and explore um, your thinking and your work in Mathematics for Human Flourishing, in particular, having you walk through um, how you got to this work. Um, second, I would love for you to reflect on how your own thinking and your own work might provide insight into what we might be doing differently in higher education more generally. And then third, I'd love you to reflect on this past year and whether your own thinking has changed in, in any way, given um, all the craziness of the past 12, 15 months. Um, does that sound reasonable to you? That's great. Okay, good. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, and let's really start with how you begin the book. Uh, with Simone Weil and Christopher Jackson. Um, it, can you talk about how that particular quote and your relationship with Christopher Jackson um, have shaped your thinking and in particular the kinds of arguments you make about the relationship between mathematics and human flourishing? Sure, yeah, thank you. So I, I um... You know, I'm thinking about writing a book that that talks about what it means to, to be human being and uh, how math connects with that. I, I the, the book had to start with human stories, and um, the, the three stories that that feature probably most prominently in the book are my own uh, a story of hardship and struggle, uh, as well as those of Simone Weil, who's uh, a, a a French religious mystic, but also um, the younger. Uh, sister of a famous mathematician and who always compared herself to her her older brother in mathematics. Uh, and then that of Christopher Jackson, who's a, uh, an inmate in a federal prison, who out of the blue wrote me uh, a letter uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, and from that, we started a correspondence over mathematics. Uh, and I, I guess one of the things that um, uh, has really shaped my thinking about mathematics in the book is this correspondence with with Chris, who you know most people, including myself, might easily write off. You know, I, I'm, I'm a math professor, so I, of course, I believe that math is for everybody. That that you know that, um, of course, I, I intellectually assent to the idea that we, that everybody can do math and everybody can have enjoyable experiences in math. But really, you know, I. I when you're when you're really pressed with this question, like, do I believe that somebody who uh, was convicted of a series of armed robberies uh, and sitting in prison for for uh, uh, for several decades, um, his his sentence is is 32 years. Uh, do I really believe that math has something to offer him? Uh, and uh, in many ways, this this opening with the story of Chris is actually a, a way of helping the reader see. Um, uh, not just see Chris differently, but see themselves differently, right? In, in, in many ways, it's, it's, a, it's a way of saying, look, do, do you really believe that somebody like Christopher, that math has something to offer this person? And, you know, really, his story is a story of how math has changed him. It's not a story of how, how I taught him math. It's really a story of how he's shaped my thinking uh, in many ways. Great. Um... So you, you describe in, in this prelude to Chris Jackson, this, this notion that math can be for everybody and that math as something joyful. Um, as a parent of many teenagers who struggle with math um, and of thinking of one of my daughters who recently described her math experience in high school as a degradation ceremony. Um, I, great. It, how did you how did you come to this notion of, of math as joyful as a math as a source of beauty and love and and grace I, for for many people that's those sort of you know sort of it's an oxymoron to think of math in in those terms yeah yeah i mean my own um 
experience early on was one of a playful attitude to math. And, and part of that was encouraged by people around me. And I had parents who, who asked interesting questions of me. I had, you know, friends, uh, uh, parents, friends who, who, you know, who would, who would challenge me to, you know, uh, with interesting math questions and puzzles. Uh, and so my early introduction was this sort of joyful side of math, the playful side of math, where you tinker with ideas. Uh, and uh, it really wasn't until later when I started experiencing some of the ways that people use math to, to degrade. Um, that, that's an interesting phrase that your, um, your child used. It, it, it really is, can often be the case that people have degrading experiences in math because uh, math can be taught often uh, in a way that is very, um, um, uh, very degrading, right? Like forced memorization, like, <laughs> yes, it's important to know some math facts, right? But it, it, it'd, it'd be a lot like, uh, you know, forcing people to play musical scales uh, before they've heard a symphony, you know, it'd be, it'd be a lot like getting people to, 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 to practice free throws when they've never seen a basketball game. And in, in a lot of, our experiences can be that way. Uh, and we often use math to, to rank people, to sort people, uh, to divide people into the, those people who have it and those people who don't. Um, these are all very um, degrading ways of, of using mathematics. And I, I wanted to, to call people to think about math differently. I mean, math, if, if we stop seeing math as something that is, uh, is basically a tool to achieve some other ends, stop seeing math as solely instrumental, start seeing math as a way to cultivate certain virtues uh, and, um, and to be, to, to experience more of what it means to be a human being. I, that's the kind of math that I want to promote. And that's the kind of math that I think people would, would actually seriously enjoy. Um, you know, sort of right, the, this notion of math for everyone, this notion of math that's playful, um, that's a space to cultivate virtue, I, I find immensely compelling. Um, it, are you alone in this perspective? Uh, is, are you the leading edge of a trend within mathematics? Do you have, are there lots of other people who are starting to think this way about yeah. math? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I, I'm, I'm not the first person to say that math should be more human. And in fact, a, a number of people over the years have been uh, trying to call people to a greater awareness of, of uh, the ways we dehumanize uh, people um, using mathematics or math education. But one of the things that I, I guess I, I wanted to do uh, with the book uh, and the speech that preceded it, that was the genesis for the book, was to try to call the math community to think a, a deeply about the purposes for math. Like why, why is it that people should learn math? Is it, is it just to get a good job? Is it just to, um, to say that I have a PhD and therefore I am somehow accomplished and elite uh, in some ways? O or is there some greater purpose? And so part of what I wanted to do is to, to bring people and, and also call, my, call myself to think more deeply, like what is it what is it that, that actually draws us to any of our passions, whether that be math or something else? And so the book really begins with a question of not really a question, not, not really about mathematics as so much as what, it, what does it mean to be a human being? Well, we all have desires. We all have a desire for beauty, for truth, for, uh, for justice, for community, for freedom. You know, these are all things that people desire. And so then uh, the book is really an exploration of how math can meet some of these desires. Uh, or how it should meet, maybe currently doesn't meet um, some of these desires. Um, and you know, if, if, if you see how math meets some of these desires that we all have, these longings we all have, of course you're gonna find math maybe more, much more um, interesting and beautiful and, and worthwhile. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's really, that's really, um, that's really the, the part that I see as my, my contribution is, is thinking trying to connect math to these deeper human desires, and then trying to articulate through those desires what the virtues are that you build uh, as, you, um, as you study math through the lens of these desires. 
So um, analytically, it seems that, right, I, I think one of the important things you've done is break math away from the instrumental value as a, a means to an end, as a way to achieve something else and to appreciate math for what math can cultivate and, and identify the virtues that are possible through math, which um, I, I think is both extraordinary and, and eloquent in how you articulate it. Um, you know, I, I noticed, I listened to the talk that preceded the book and um, many folks have noted, right, you received a standing ovation at, around the talk. Do you, do you think that um, this is somewhat of a tipping point in the math community and that others are starting, you're saying that, that this way of thinking and connecting math to humanity didn't start with you, but do you think there's an increasing movement toward this or do you think this is more a particular group of folks who are thinking this way? I, I, I hope so. I, I, do, I do believe more and more people are beginning to see the importance of uh, math not just being its own uh, separate esoteric uh, area of study, uh, but something that uh, in its best forms should, should call us all to be uh, better uh, people, better humans. Uh, and, uh, and maybe that's a, some, for some people, it feels like a little bit of a stretch, like how in the world are you, are, you know, people sometimes say, are you saying that math is going to make you a better person, right? Like a, as if, again, somehow, we're measuring ourselves, our, our human dignity and worth by uh, how moral or how good we are. Uh, and I'm saying, no, I'm not saying that math uh, gives you a greater claim to human dignity or, or human worth, but I am saying that it can enable you to uh, experience the world uh, in, in ways that we all deserve to have a chance to experience, to see the world differently, to, uh, and not just to see the world differently, but a, as a result, flourish as a result, be able to, uh, to um, uh, experience more of what the world has to offer and, and also to contribute to it. And, and so maybe there is a connection there. I mean, in, it, that seems also a stretch. Like I talk in the book of, about the importance of, of, uh, of um, cultivating community, right? That's not, that's not a view that everybody shares. Right? <laughs> but I think everybody, if you think about it, who, who does math actually in some sense, realizes the importance of community. But why don't we elevate that in the way we teach mathematics? That's mm -hmm. part of the question, um, some of the questions that the book explores. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing though, like if you think a little bit about, about um, uh, you know, your, your um, I don't remember if you said it was your teenager, but uh, who had degrading experiences in math. You know, on the other hand, many people, you know, experience mathematics already and they don't realize it. Right when when who doesn't love to play a game, right? Whether that be a board game or a, a sports game of some some kind, and and strategic thinking is such a huge part of playing that game, right? You you have uh, to think if this happens, then that happens. You have to go down the road of different possibilities, right? This that's mathematical thinking already. People are doing it all the time. Uh, when you have to place yourself uh, in 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 uh, uh, in uh, analyze a game from multiple different perspectives. Mm -hmm. That's a virtue built by the practice of, of playing the game, but also practice doing mathematics. That's what math trains you to do is to think, you know, there are multiple perspectives on this problem. There are many ways to try to solve the problem. How can we, um, how can we get people who, first of all, learn mathematics and see that side of math to connect that with their daily experiences? That's also part of what I'm trying to do is to help people already know math and do math to say, hey, you know, this really should shape the way you live your life if it doesn't already. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important and interesting point to make because um, you started by saying like oftentimes math is like um, learning to do a free throw without ever seeing a basketball game. Right, so it's sort of disconnected from the greater whole. Um, it, and that combined with the instrument, instrumentalization of mathematics often. So you're learning math toward a particular major that you wanna pursue that you really love and care about or a particular vocation that you wanna pursue, not as an end into itself. And so it's, right, we almost think of math not, right, not as something 
um, complete in it as a complete organism, if you will, but as sort of this, these pieces that we experience towards another end. And so it's really leached of meaning for so many people as they experience it in your average public high school in the United States. Yes, that's right. And, and that's part of the problem with, uh, you know, people often uh, look at, you know, is debates that rage about algebra. Should we teach algebra? And, you know, we can talk about that. I certainly don't want to necessarily do that here. But, <laughs> but um, well, you know, one, one, one of the reasons people have this debate is they see algebra as mindless abstraction. And, you know, in its, in its worst forms, that's what, that's what abstraction is. It can be mindless. And, and for people who don't see the meaning in it, that's a, that's a real obstacle. Uh, but, you know, in its best forms, abstraction is really not, doesn't strip away meaning. It actually enriches meaning. You know, I like to say that, that when you, you know, abstraction is basically trying to, to solve many problems at once, right? That's, that's one of the, the reasons we abstract is we, we strip away what's inessential and look at just what's essential uh, to, um, to solving a problem. Uh, and so that's, it, it, and so I certainly don't want to knock people who study very abstract mathematics because I do that as well. And, but part of the reason I do it is because I see the meaning. Uh, and if, if, if we have um, an educational system that doesn't promote meaning, then we, uh, we really uh, run at the ground, I think. Um, another thing that you, you mentioned was this notion um, that it's, it's not as if you are um, trying to, that mathematics necessarily creates a, a moral varsity team or makes people uh, more ethical in some way, because again, that's getting back to this um, kind of reductionist thinking about what, what mathematics can be. Uh, but it's a space where we can all experience virtue. Mm -hmm. um, and a, as such is a, is a place of, of human flourishing. Um, it, is that, a, um, right, I'm, I'm trying to think as sort of, right, as an ethics institute that is committed to cultivating character um, and, and thinks that character and virtue are things that you practice and do indeed get better at um, over time. Um, it, it, is the goal really access to truth and beauty and joy um, for everyone? Or is it, does, it, does math not in some ways in the pursuit of the kind of uh, work you're doing make you more open and versatile with those ideas if even if we're not going to rank you on some hierarchy of virtue yeah I, I think I, I think I understand what you're what you're getting at I mean I I, 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 I want to steer away from ranking people according to virtue but mm -hmm. but I am unequivocally saying that math does in fact increase your persistence to solve you know, to, to, to sit with a problem for a long time. Uh, that's a virtue. Uh, it does make you more curious. Uh, it does cause you to ask better questions. These are all virtues built by the, uh, by, by the practice of doing mathematics. It does cause you to want to, uh, to understand deeply, uh, to think for oneself, uh, to think rigorously, to, have, to be circumspect about what you know and what you don't know. These are all virtues. Uh, and, um, uh, and so, and, and they're, you know, virtues cultivated by doing other things as well, but math, I think, cultivates some of these virtues in a, in a unique way that I think everybody should have the chance to experience and uh, to, uh, uh, and to live. Um, one of the things I kept thinking about in reading your book was the, the way you describe mathematics it feels like a humanities. Um, the, the kinds of arguments you're making are the classic arguments we've been making about humanistic inquiry for centuries. Um, it, how, how would you think about that? You know, you think about math as a STEM discipline, um, not as a humanity, but the way you describe it, it feels humanistic. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and certainly it maybe shouldn't surprise us, you know, that math was 
you know, part of the original uh, quadrivium. You know, in, in, in some ways, it's, it's uh, shaping one's uh, ability to think and reason. And uh, isn't that something that all of us should, should want to be able to do? I mean, in many ways, I, the, the book does sort of argue for mathematics as, uh, uh, as something that everybody should experience. But in, 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 as you are pointing out, it's actually a broad argument for the liberal arts. Because I, I would certainly want everybody to be able to see mathematics as something that is, um, uh, that is uh, very closely aligned with the humanities uh, in the sense that it, it, it is uh, calling us to be, to, 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 to be different, right? That's, that's part of what, you know, when I think of virtue, I think of a, a being aspect and a doing aspect. And the being aspect uh, calls us to do, to, 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 to live differently. Uh, and so with mathematics, uh, it, it is, it, it, those of us who practice mathematics see and experience all the human sides of it. But somehow in a math classroom, we reduced it to solve this problem in this amount of time, right? Like that's, that's extremely, that's stripping away everything about mathematics that actually makes it wonderful for those of us who practice it, right? We, 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 those of us who practice math see community as essential, right? This is part of the community of scholars who study mathematics and share beautiful ideas. We, we come to it through beauty, right? We, we are seeking to, to, to figure out its truth. But somehow, you know, when you're, the assessments we use in our classrooms don't match the things that we value. Why is that? That's part of the question that I, I hope, um, I hope we, can, we can all begin to, to, to dig into. Math is more, of a, more a process than it is about getting results. Yet in, in our achievement-oriented society, we are always about results, right? And so uh, math is, you know, people think of math as just getting right answers. No, it's actually actually about a right process as well, right? We should we should cultivate good habits of thinking, and isn't that you know part of what what the liberal arts tradition is all about? Great. So let's try to turn a little bit to some of that conversation, but I, I first want to start with um, a distinction you made in the personal note on your website about the distinction between um, dignity and credibility. Um, and right, it, as a professional mathematician, um, did you have to establish credibility um, in traditional ways before you were able to, to pursue mathematics as a, as a form of human flourishing, right? Did you have to, right, sort of conform to a particular model that gave you that credibility that now allows you this liberty? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I'd have to say, I'd have to say yes. And I'd have to say that I uh, have, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I have to say that, uh, that it, it, unfortunately that's, it's, the, it's too often the case that we, you know, we have this system that we have to live in uh, and then within that system, we find ways to flourish. Uh, and part of the story, one of the stories I tell in the book is how I almost quit mathematics because, uh, because of uh, uh, a, a particular person who made my experience really disheartening and degrading in, in many ways. Uh, and so one of the things that I think was very helpful was me wrestling with this question why am I doing math? I mean, that's really the, the, the book, if you have to push back many years now, it, it sort of comes back to the wrestling I did back in graduate school when I thought about quitting math, quitting my dream of getting a PhD and asking myself, well, why do I really need this PhD? Is it, is it really just because I wanna say I have a PhD in mathematics from Harvard? I mean, is that, is that really it? And can I give that up? And, and uh, one of the great things that happened, I have to say, one of the best things that happened was was that struggling with that question and being able to say, yes, I'm gonna give this up. Like, yes, it's okay if I don't get my PhD. And then being called back to doing math because, it, because I found that I missed it, right? And so I think that actually has given me a lot of freedom. So it's given me freedom to taking risks. Like I, I know that I knew at that point that you know, maybe I would never be the best mathematician in the world but if I came back to doing math, I'd do it because I love it and because it gives me joy. And I've been fortunate to have, uh, to have had success after that 
very bad experience in grad school in doing research and gaining credibility through these traditional channels. But I also have to say that because of that, when I have opportunities to talk about math in ways that are maybe unpopular, I've taken those risks because I, I realized I didn't need this PhD or this credibility to give me the dignity that I, that I seek. Uh, and so, and, and as part of, you know, I, I had no idea how this speech would be received by the math community, but that's part of why I thought, okay, you know, I have this opportunity uh, to give this, this talk, um, I'm gonna do it. Great. So, I, you know, as we reflect on math, it, right, within the liberal arts, um, as part of a comprehensive undergraduate education, as we reflect on graduate training in mathematics, um, how should we be thinking and doing differently? Uh, you started to address some of these things about the relationship between solving problems and processes, but, um, you know, if, if Mathematic, mathematics education, say for undergraduates, was entirely up to you nationally. What would we do, be doing differently? Are there three things you're like, here's my strategic plan to redo? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. I mean, I, of course, my, my, my experience has been uh, in education mainly been at the college level. And mm -hmm. so I, I think I can only speak more, 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 um, uh, uh, more authoritatively about that. Uh, and, uh, um, but maybe there's some implications for teaching at other levels as well. I mean, I think one of the things we really have to rethink in mathematics is assessment. How do we assess learning that mathematics um, that students are doing in math? Um, the traditional way we assess uh, students is uh, through uh, exams, time tests, solve problems. Uh, but we don't actually think much about the kinds of virtues that we're building. And part of the reason is assessing virtues is actually really hard, right? Assessing whether someone can get an answer is easy, but assessing whether they actually are creative, that's hard, right? So how do we admit people to PhD programs? Well, we want people who are creative in problem solving, but what we do instead is we look at grades and GRE scores, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I've been teaching long enough now to know that students, some students who don't perform well in tests are actually some of the most creative thinkers um, who, you know, on a team of mathematicians can provide the sort of key spark or insight that, that gets a problem solved. How do we measure that? That's hard. That's, that requires hard thinking. So that, that's one of the things I would say at the college level really needs to change um, pretty drastically. Uh, and, um, and we need to begin to recognize there's more sides to doing mathematics than just proving theorems. Uh, and uh, these things should somehow be rewarded uh, professionally uh, for, math, for math, mathematicians, and they're not. Um, yeah, in terms of other things, I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of changing education at, at all levels, I think it's, it's really important for people to, as you were saying, connect math to meaningful experiences. Mm -hmm. And and part of that means centering the student rather than centering the faculty member or the teacher, right? The teacher likes to teach. We all want to teach the way we learn, and uh, that's because that's how that's the way we were successful. But we don't actually often think about what the student needs and how this how to center the student student thinking in uh, in the way we teach. And I think we did more of that. If we listened more to our students and what they what the way they that they think and process we would learn a lot as teachers and we'd know better how to connect to to them and, and make math meaningful to them how um you know at a place like duke um certainly um one of the struggles for students will be a, a differential high school experience with math um, and their ability to be successful in university level math is, is somewhat dependent on that prior experience and, and dependent in two ways. One, um, their human experience with math to date, um, but also their academic experience with math to date. How, how can uh, colleges and universities um, better enable students to flourish in math to, to be successful and love math given prior experience, which can often be 
uh, super mixed and not always the best. Yeah. Of course, many students come into a place like Duke uh, uh, having had, you know, their main experience is rushing to take calculus in high school so they can meet an entrance requirement or, or look good for admission committees. Uh, and, you know, calculus is a wonderful subject, and I, I love for people to see uh, why it's a wonderful subject. It's a human, you know, pinnacle of human thought and imagination. I'd love, I'd love people to learn calculus that way. Uh, but often calculus is just taught as a bunch of rules without meaning making them. Uh, people get through it just in order to get into Duke, right? Uh, and so one of the one of the things that really we need to think seriously about is 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 how the articulation between high school and colleges. Uh, we need to think a little bit about what our entrance requirements are. Why why is calculus an entrance requirement for some for many colleges? Uh, and maybe it shouldn't be the only kind of math that's valued. We need to think about giving students experiences in high school that don't just privilege calculus over everything else. There's many, many kinds of mathematical thinking that are valuable and, um, and, and frankly, more relevant to student experience than calculus. Uh, I, I love for calculus to be taught, uh, but I also think that there are many other kinds of math. Discrete mathematics is, is huge and becoming more important as we live in an age of data. Um, working with data, statistics, these are all things that I think are, are, are valuable and, uh, and more meaningful for students and could be another entryway into math. So at the college level then, I would say uh, colleges need to start building uh, programs, mathematics programs and other programs that don't, that don't say, that don't funnel, try to funnel everybody through this one class through mm -hmm. calculus. Um, and we need to be offering uh, courses that are that are more about the joy of math to students who will never take another math class. Uh, courses that are more like this architecture appreciation course I took in, in college. And, you know, I needed to fulfill an art requirement. I took this architecture class and it changed, it changed my life, right? It changed the way I look at buildings. And that's the way I like to think about math. Couldn't we all have a math course that changes the way we look at life, you know, look at an idea. I mean, I, I can't go to a, 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 you know, a new city now and not look at the buildings and be able to tell you a few things just by looking at the buildings. That's an appreciation that I have from that one architecture class in college mm -hmm. that literally changed the way I look at the world. Couldn't we all have a math class like that? That'd be wonderful. An intro class, no prerequisites, uh, and nothing to follow. Are there other things as you look at um, how we teach math, the, the actual curriculums that we use in universities or the ways we approach students and engage students in, in mathematics that you think we might address? First of all, we need to, to hire mathematics professors who actually uh, uh, know and care about teaching and wanna grow in, in teaching. Uh, and of course, there are many faculty who want to grow in teaching, but um, the, the value systems of universities don't uh, allow for it or don't um, credit that in some way. And that needs to change, I think. Uh, it, uh, it, if, if we're, I mean, if we're, if we're going to get students interested in math, we can't be putting people in front of them who, uh, who um, don't know how to get them excited about mathematics and connect to their experiences rather than teaching them only what, what they think are, uh, is beautiful. Great. Um, before we open it up to questions, I just wanted to, to ask you to reflect a little bit on this crazy, strange year and how it might have changed. Your book came out in 2020. Um, did, did this year, uh, the twin pandemics of uh, structural racism and COVID-19, have they, in any way changed your thinking, amplified it, altered it? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, in, in some ways the book is, uh, it, it was, was timely in the sense that it does try to address issues of racism towards the, in the later chapters uh, in, in structural inequities that are often due to the, the color of our skin or the kind of, uh, of uh, experience that we had, um, the kinds of schools we were able to, to attend. Uh, and so, it, in 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 that way, I think that the uh, the events of, of the current time have only amplified my 
my resolve that you know math needs to change and needs to change quickly. But so you know, of course, another thing that of course happened throughout the whole pandemic is you know the rise of misinformation mm -hmm. and uh, the ability to not discern truth by thinking for oneself. Right? We're so polarized because we only trust certain sources. We listen to them and without thinking about it. And we're not able to process information for ourselves. Well, if, if there's one virtue that I think mathematics actually should build and does build and ought to transfer its skills is the ability to think independently. Like I don't need an external source of authority to help me understand why the Pythagorean theorem is true, right? I don't need an external source of authority to tell me what, to help me see why three times five equals five times three, right? I just think about a, a, a grid of cookies Three, three rows and five columns. And I look at it two different ways and I'm like, oh, they're the same. You know, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we hope transfers uh, and uh, helps people make sense of what's going on in, in the world today. So good. Um, let me turn to the first question. Um, do the arguments you make about math cultivating virtue extend to our other STEM disciplines, even those that are very practical? For instance, can engineering be an avenue for human flourishing? And if so, how? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I certainly, uh, certainly uh, uh, agree and believe that other disciplines, STEM disciplines, uh, someone could take, a, take the, the, my book idea and sort of translate it to their own discipline, right? Um, how is it that the study of engineering uh, enables people to pursue beauty? I think you could, uh, you could build a whole, a whole book or class around that. That's, that's basically what design is, engineering design. Uh, thinking a little bit about you know, the, the, um, the um, design principles uh, and making things that are, uh, building things that are actually useful and, and, uh, and, uh, and beautiful and appeal to people's uh, innate sense for beauty. The, 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 certainly one could talk about that. One can talk about the search for truth in science. One could talk about um, the importance of community in all these disciplines. Um, yeah, I, I, I certainly agree. In fact, I would love for somebody to write a book, Engineering for Human Flourishing or something like that. <laughs> so it sounds like a, there's a series in the making here as you, as you go through the different STEM disciplines and engineering to kind of X for human flourishing. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I have a, a, one of my best friends is a, is a, uh, a chemist and, you know, he, he gets to tell you about the beauty of, of building molecules and understanding how molecules work so that you can, you know, design, design things that are, that, uh, you know, new, new, um, new uh, 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 molecules that do interesting things. And he's into green chemistry. You know, that's, that's certainly a way to, to seek the human flourishing of, of our world by, um, building uh, things that actually enable us to live sustainably. And so um, we talked a little bit about whether essentially you're a unicorn within mathematics, sort of promoting this notion of human flourishing. Are you, are you seeing it in other STEM disciplines? You talk about this colleague in chemistry. Is Are other disciplines that you're familiar with starting to think in similar terms? Uh, that's a, a good question. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not so, not as aware of what's going on in, in other fields. Um, I mean, I, I do think there's, of course, a whole, whole whole group of people who normally think of the human flourishing. These are philosophers who, who mm -hmm. connect with that idea, uh, and and maybe um, this framing around human flourishing uh, can be helpful to others. I certainly would love to see that. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, Francis, you mentioned that assessment in math is challenging. Tell us a bit more about your thoughts about traditional grading and how it should be changed. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I've certainly, as a result of thinking about these things, uh, tried to change the way I, I think about uh, assessing what students know. Uh, usually, you know, the traditional model is you take a snapshot of what they know and they get part of that, you know, they get their, they, they get their grade for that and then it's fixed. You know, that fraction of your grade is, is determined. Uh, and, you know, one of the ways that assessment 
has been changing and is a whole community of people thinking about it who've informed me is this idea of moving towards mastery-based grading where students are, are, are able to uh, retake assessments on various ideas until they've met certain standards. Uh, and then those standards help inform the, the grade. So that's, that's one way to, to change assessment that I think is promising. I haven't uh, done a lot of, but I certainly am paying attention to what people are doing. Uh, another thing that I think is important is, is uh, moving towards um, trying to, uh, uh, to, to give students some opportunity for reflecting, making formative assessment part of the way we evaluate um, students, ask them to reflect on beauty and, uh, and um, talk about how they, you know, how the process of struggling is actually important. You know, that's, that's something that, that math builds. Yet somehow we're only evaluating people on results. And yet one of the best virtues that math builds is the ability to sit with a hard problem and struggle with it. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions I often ask in my, in my um, exam, uh, a final exam is, how has the process of learning to struggle with a problem built in you, um, how has that benefited you? Uh, and just by asking the question, you show your students that you value the struggle, not just the, the results. Uh, and, and I almost don't care how that, that question is graded. You know, if, if students give a thoughtful answer, I give nearly full credit, full points. But, but what are you doing? You're, you're showing something to your students. You're showing students what you value. And so that's the question really before us, I think, in assessment is, is how, do you, how do you show students that that, that uh, the things you, you actually value, mm -hmm. uh, how do they show up on your assessments? That's great. Um, okay, next one. Could you comment a bit further, please, about how your work supports and diverges from anti-racist math practice? Yeah, so that's, so first of all, anti-racism, anti-racist math practices, I mean, by itself, there's a whole, you know, set of ideas uh, and, and thinking that that's go going in there. So it's kind of hard to, to, to speak to just one aspect of that. Um, I certainly do, I, I do think, and I resonate with the ideas that, you know, we do have often baked into the way we teach uh, uh, structural um, racism. That's one way to put it, you know, in terms of the way we think about uh, uh, about mathematics, right? Like if, if, if we, for instance, um, uh, are shepherding certain students uh, towards honors courses and other students, uh, and, and we're not doing that with you know, other students. And, and why is that? Because we're assessing them in certain ways. And those uh, ways favor traditional assessments, you know, the traditional things that are, these are all way, places where racism can actually easily enter. Uh, and so, um, I, I would say that the work that I've been doing, while not couched in the language of anti-racism, is actually something that um, would promote uh, uh, equity and uh, and looking at at students' true potential rather than um, just what we measure through um, traditional assessments. Great. Um, here's the next one. It's a twofer. How can you integrate? moral virtue education into core mathematical curriculum without it looking like an add-on? For example, do you have suggestions for non-course offerings, e.g. experiences, events by which students can encounter math and its human flourishing offerings in ways that you described the architecture class? Yeah, uh, service learning is one way that I think that can be effectively done. If you uh, uh, think a little bit about how to incorporate service learning into your classes. For instance, I have a friend who, uh, as part of a project every year, uh, in uh, on you know taking a, around taking data related to um, community um, issues, actually has people go out in the community and interview people. Right. So if they did a project on homelessness. Uh, then what they begin to what students begin to realize is that you know a data point is is more than just a data point. It's actually a human being behind that data point and uh, learning their stories, understanding how data is, um, 
is more than just a, a number, uh, I think is really valuable. And service learning can certainly do that. Great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of returning, um, whoops, here's another one. Uh, do you have thoughts on the vulnerabilities we have uh, when our mathematical thinking is weak? Oh yeah. Um, so the, the 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 probably the easiest one to point to is uh, if we are not able to to reason and think for ourselves, then we're going to be more easily duped. We're going to be taken advantage of by by people who. Um, want to manipulate us. We're not going to be able to think critically about how technology is being used. I mean, for instance, we're all very excited and happy for some of the latest technological innovations, right? The things that the, the, the things that the GPS that's in our phone and uh, you know all the 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 new thing gizmos that we have. But then we you know, only only more recently began realizing, hey, wait a minute, if algorithms are running the way we, you know, who gets loans uh, and who, um, where, where policing happens in the city, algorithms are, you know, people are, police departments are using that, then if we don't think critically about how this, then we realize, oh my gosh, like, okay, and Google, of course, is, you know, search engine, you, you type in, type in uh, some, something, you're looking for something else. Well, how is it that algorithms are, are shaping what we what decisions we make right if, if we don't think if we if we don't actually learn mathematics and think about mathematics in, in a human humane way we're going to avoid asking some of the questions the hard questions that need to be asked great um here's and i think we'll probably take this as our final question um it asks, my father was deeply gifted in math and music, and he saw them as closely related. Music seems to be a source of joy for many. Uh, do you see music or other creative arts, or do you use music or other creative arts in your teaching? Does the joy slosh over from one to the other? I like yeah. that slosh overing the joy. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Music and math, I think, share a lot uh, in terms of um, of uh, their the dispositions one can have. I mean, certainly having a disposition towards mathematical or musical beauty, I think those are, share a lot in common. Uh, and I think one can inform the other. Certainly, like you know, if if I, I I love using the music analogy because you know we like to categorize people as math people or not math people. People will say I'm not a math person, but whoever says I'm not a music person. I, I think that happens probably, but not as much, because we can all have meaningful experiences in music, whether or not we choose to pursue music as a profession. And so uh, similarly in mathematics, I think um, uh, the opportunities are there for people to enjoy mathematical thinking and actually realize that they're doing a lot of it already um, without necessarily them getting a PhD in mathematics. So I, I think there's opportunities there. Um, and there's probably some, you know, affinity because of that affinity. I think there's there's some link between those people who do math and who do music. Although I, I'm not sure that the the link is as profound as as some uh, as some claim, uh, because there's certainly lots of people who do math who are not, you know, who are not musicians and, and don't necessarily play an instrument or anything like that, and, and vice versa. But uh, yeah, do I think that that relationship is profitable and and, and fruitful uh, in in uh, uh, in the best sense of the word, I, I think so. Um, just a quick follow up on on that question, and it's the questions are keep rolling in. Um, what would you suggest for a person who says I'm I'm not a math person and is probably recalling you know sort of a negative experience of you know or a lack of success in math? what would you suggest in the same way that we can probably all for a person who might say, I'm not a music person, you should listen to this or you should um, do this. What, what would you suggest for math? Like what, what would um, reintroduce a person who thinks of themselves as not a math person uh, to the joy of math from your perspective, besides your book? Well, joy, joy can happen in many, come in many forms and happen in different ways. 
And so even uh, for the musician, uh, I mean, for the music example, uh, it's hard to say to somebody, I'm not, a, you know, who says I'm not a music person, listen to Beethoven, because they may listen to Beethoven and then say, well, I'm really not a music person because I, I don't like Beethoven. Uh, and so I, I think a, a, a more fruitful strategy is, is uh, look, in, look, at what, look at what they're listening to already in some mm -hmm. sense, uh, and try to connect to people's, people's um, human desires that way. And so, of course, it's certainly a self-serving comment to say part of why I wrote this book is to help people see that you're a human being, you have these desires. <laughs> And whatever these desires are, um, there are ways that math can meet those desires and, and, and maybe entice people to, to, uh, to see a side of math that they haven't seen before. Um, I never thought math instruction could be political. For example, on a personal level, I encounter this as politicians, not mathematicians, write law about what I should instruct and assess. Uh, what has been your experience with building a community of professional practice on a local level? Uh, do you, uh, professional practice related to um, math instruction or? Yeah, to, related to math instruction. So maybe this is your experience at Harvey Mudd, for example. Yeah. 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 I, and so I, I'm also trying to understand uh, what the connection to the polit political uh, question was, but I'll, I'll try to address what I think the, the question is. No, I think it's, uh, I think what it's saying is um, that if, we, especially if we look at say high school curricula, right, the legislature, legislators come up with uh, decision-making rules about what gets instructed and how, and then students and teachers are assessed on those criterion as, a, as opposed to generating from mathematicians what should be taught and how mm -hmm. yeah um i mean I, I one of the 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 things i think about when you ask that question is uh, is you know one i took a trip to alaska once and i met a math educator there who was talking a bit about um uh how she was using in her classroom this um the fact that you know the 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 sun, uh, so they have very very long days and long nights, and so I, uh, what she was doing was connecting mathematics to um, understanding how quickly the 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 sunsets and sunrises were changing from day to day. Uh, and you know my my thought when I heard that was wow that's really neat this would really connect to students in Alaska it would never work for students in Alabama. Right, who don't experience the same kind of things, and so from that perspective, I think every question about what math kinds of math, what math examples, these curricula should be taught, I think in that sense should be local. Um, on the other hand, there are certain uh, ideas, certain you know categories of 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 uh, thoughts. While they don't prescribe examples, certainly do um, I think uh, run across many different you know aspects of what it means to do math. And so that's, I think, what are what the effort at the, the standardization, for the, like the common core standards or other kinds of standards are, are aimed at. <laughs> and so I, I see those as useful and beneficial, uh, as long as they don't necessarily prescribe the kinds of examples that are, you know, are used from day to day, because those have to be localized. So, uh, you know, part of I, I guess what I'm, I'm saying here is um, a lot of deep thought has gone into what standards are, are important. Uh, and I generally think um, that trend is a is a, a good one, uh, but one has to recognize the local culture as well. Great. Um, and so it's time to wrap up, and we always try to wrap up on a hopeful note. Um, and one of the final questions was, uh, what does what is something hopeful that mathematics could offer us in this moment? Uh, I think one thing math can offer us is if uh, if we do it well is the is is clear thinking. Uh, it's uh, a certain intellectual humility. You know, one of the things you you learn as you do math is to um, is you know when you build a model is you state the limitations of the model and you understand uh, what the boundaries are of, of of knowledge that you are you know in fact uh, in fact building. 
Uh, and so I, I would hope that if math, as math is being taught well and, and done well, people would think clearly and reason well. Uh, and um, that I think can help us cut through the fog of misinformation that's going on these days. People to be able to evaluate whether um, some statement that somebody made about some you know, numerical claim is, is actually reasonable or not. That's, that's a skill all of us want to have, right? This is why your math teachers always say, once you get an answer, is the answer reasonable? Because the, the, you know, part of it when you focus only on answers is just getting an answer is, is you don't think about the context. You know, like, does it make sense that, you know, you could have 3 million, you know, false fraudulent ballots? That's a question, right? And if you think mathematically, you can begin to evaluate that claim just on its own merits rather than just trusting a, an authority to tell you. So great. With that, I just want to thank you so, so very much. Um, the Q&A is going wild with appreciation for you and your work. Um, so we're delighted to have been able to have this conversation with you today. Um, and for everybody listening in, I wanted to let you know that we have Father Greg Boyle with us next week. We'll be talking about good work and kinship. So thank you so much, Francis. This has just been truly delightful. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful for me too. Great. Have a wonderful afternoon.